Boeing and Airbus has both upgraded the engines to their 737 and Airbus A320 families during the last decade. The new engines that they fitted are a whopping 14 to 15 percent more efficient than the older ones. But now the CFM Rise engine promises to completely eclipse this performance. And strangely, we almost had this type of engine three decades ago. It's a really fascinating story, so stay tuned. In a recent video I did, I discussed the surprising announcement that came from Boeing that they're not going to launch or even start designing a new airliner until after the end of this decade. Now, obviously, there's a lot of details about what this really means and how it's affected by Boeing's position relative to Airbus. And if you want to check that video out, uh, I can link to it up here. But one important factor in Boeing's strategy is likely the expectations of a new technological leap or a step change in engine efficiency. As I said in the beginning, the CFM rise is a central part in this, but to understand why, we have to talk a little bit about how jet engines have already been evolving over time. Now, if you compare the jet engines of older aircraft with today's, you will see that they are constantly getting larger in diameter. And that's because for a jet engine to be able to generate more thrust, it has to either push the air backward faster or push a larger air mass at the same speed. The latter option, more air, same speed, is the more efficient option. And this is why turbofan engines have been getting bigger and bigger by time, because that have enabled them to increase their bypass ratio, meaning that they use a bigger fan which can push more air around or bypass the engine core. However, a problem with making these engines larger and larger is that they are also getting heavier. Even so, modern high-bypass turbofans are still more efficient than the older designs, despite the weight penalty that comes with encasing the whole thing in a bigger and bigger nacelle. But there are other ways for a jet engine to push a really large air mass backwards. One option that the engine makers and aircraft manufacturers were exploring in the 1980s was the prop fan, also known as an unducted fan or an open rotor. In their simplest form, open rotors work like turbofans, except that the fan is not encased in a nacelle. In order to have the necessary efficiency, thrust and a manageable diameter, these early open rotors had two counter-rotating fan discs. These fans had a variable pitch, unlike the fan blades on the turbofans that we have today, and that increased their efficiency further. A number of companies worked on these designs, but the ones that were developed the most in the 1980s were the Pratt & Whitney Allison 578 Delta X-Ray and the General Electric GE36. The Pratt & Whitney Allison variant built on previous research that Allison had done on a prop fan design for NASA. General Electric also based its design on NASA research and actually had the French engine manufacturer Snecma as a minority partner on the project. General Electric and Snecma were also partners in the CFM56 joint venture and today Snecma is known as Safran and of course the CFM joint venture is still ongoing. Now the reason Pratt & Whitney and General Electric were developing these prop fans was because one of them would be chosen to power the Boeing 7J7, Boeing's planned replacement for the 727. Now, of course, technically the 757 was the 727 replacement, but it was substantially bigger and had a longer range than the 727 did. And this was appreciated, obviously, by many older 727 customers, but not everyone wanted to upsize to the 757. So Boeing was developing the 7J7 to be a bit smaller than the 757-200. Of course, today we know that this didn't happen. Boeing instead developed the 737NG by enlarging the 737 to replace the 727 and to compete with the then upcoming Airbus A320 family. But it's worth remembering that the development work on the 7J7 was quite far ahead when it got scrapped. Boeing never launched the project formally, but it discussed it with a number of different airlines who wanted to replace their 727s, DC-9s and even their earlier 737s. The 7J7 would make use of space-age materials and would have an advanced cabin layout and avionics. And by the way, Boeing also circulated pictures of a fly-by-wire cockpit with sticks instead of yokes. So what actually happened to this aircraft then? Well, it turns out that what actually killed it was the engines. 
in a way, open fan engines were a bit too far ahead of their time, needing much more development and innovation. The Pratt & Whitney Allison 578 Delta X-Ray was equipped with a gearbox to drive the counter-rotating fans and there were some concerns about the reliability of those gearboxes at the time. Boeing eventually chose the GE36 partially because it didn't have that gearbox, but excessive noise was a huge problem which affected both of these designs. These engines were apparently even noisier than the low-bypass turbofans that the MD-80 and the 727 used back then. Now, some believe that the noise problem was a bit exaggerated, but it's worth remembering here that today's CFM Leap and Pratt & Whitney geared turbofans are much quieter than those old turbofans who the open fan engines were compared with. So today, they would definitely be considered as really noisy. And finally, another factor that didn't help these engines, or the Boeing 7J7 for that matter, was the fact that the oil prices dropped in the late 1980s. And with that, airlines became less interested in the idea of a new noisy plane that would be more efficient but used radically new, unproven technology. So Boeing shelved its plans indefinitely. At the same time, McDonnell Douglas were also considering an MD-80 derivative fitted with either of these engines, but the airlines just weren't interested. So why are we discussing this now then? What has changed since those early designs that would make the CFM rise not only possible but also desirable? Well, I'll tell you all about that after this short message from my sponsor. Why not kick 2023 off by trying out today's sponsor, Curiosity Stream, the best place to find and watch documentaries about science, history, technology, nature, travel and much, much more. You'll get access to exclusive award-winning films and shows that you can't watch anywhere else. Plus, the deepest collection of the best documentaries from around the world. The viewing experience is absolutely fantastic, with all titles available worldwide on almost every possible platform. Right now, I'm hooked on a series called To the Moon and Beyond, which tells the story of today's global sprint to take astronauts back to the moon and use it as a base to go further into space. It's really awesome. So, if you're a follower of this channel, you really should check out curiositystream.com slash mentor now or scan the QR code here on the screen. That will give you unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and non-fictional series. And if you use the promo code mentor now, you will save 25% on the normal price. So support me by supporting my sponsor and click on curiositystream.com slash mentor now or this one to save 25%. Thank you, CuriosityStream. Now back to the video. Obviously, fuel efficiency is really back on everyone's focus today. Boeing has come out and said that its next airliner would need to be at least 20% more efficient in order to be truly competitive. The prospects for truly great efficiency improvements in open fan engines were obvious even before the 1980s, which is why their development continued even after Boeing and McDonnell Douglas shelved their plans in the late 1980s and 90s. And during those years of development, the engineers learned a lot about the technologies that could make open fan designs really possible. And actually, this research was a process that worked great both ways. For example, General Electric worked on a composite fan blades for its all GE36 unducted fan that came in really handy for the GE90 engines that would later power the Boeing 777. And the same goes for the CFM Leap engines for the 737 MAX and the Airbus A320neo. But then there was the question of noise. And immediately, this is where the French engine manufacturer Safran came with some fantastic news. In 2017 and 2019, Safran built and tested a new open rotor concept. This engine had a similar configuration as the GE36 unducted fan, but using a gearbox to drive the two counter-rotating fans. Over the years, the gearboxes have become much more reliable, but we'll come back to that soon. The point is that, thanks to various improvements in design and materials, Safran reported that the noise levels of this engine are the same as those on the very latest CFM LEAP engines. If this is correct, that removes probably the biggest objection to this design. But it turns out that was even more great news to come. I should mention here the excellent work that Björn Ferm at Liham News has done in explaining the purpose behind this evolution in design. If you are interested in this, you have to check out the links in the description below to his work. It is absolutely awesome. 
Now, it turns out that General Electric, who was already working together with Safran on the 2017 Open Rotor project, had found a way to simplify the design. They had figured out a way to go from a pair of counter-rotating fans to only one single fan with a second set of non-rotating variable incidence stator vanes behind it. That design has now become the basis of the CFM RISE, which stands for Revolutionary Innovation for Sustainable Engines. CFM revealed this project to the public back in June 2021, but it had actually been in the works since 2019, and it really was a continuation of Safran's and General Electric's previous efforts. The move to a single rotating fan from the two counter-rotating fans on all of the previous projects only became possible thanks to new advances in computing and fluid dynamics technology that engineers back in the day could only dream of. And again, development around lightweight but strong fan blades was also crucial here. Having a single rotating fan means that a much simpler gearbox is needed. The kind of proven gearbox design that turboprops have been using for years. And this new layout could also help reduce noise levels even further. According to CFM, the RISE design will meet all current and near future noise level regulations. When it comes to efficiency, expectations around these engines are set really high. The highest bypass ratio of a modern turbofan in a single aisle aircraft today is around 12 to 1. But the design of the CFM RISE could allow bypass ratios as high as 20 to 1. Together with weight savings and other advancements that are part of the CFM RISE project, CFM believes that a 20% improvement in efficiency compared to the best engines that we have on the market today is actually a realistic target. And it goes without saying that it is this 20% improvement that makes this technology so critical for the future plans of both Boeing and Airbus. CFM plans to have an engine ready for ground tests around the middle of this decade. That's just a couple of years away from now. And then flight tests will follow in the second half of the decade. Last summer, Airbus announced that it will work together with CFM by adapting an Airbus A380 test aircraft to complete these flight tests. The CFM race will replace one of the four turbofan engines under the wing, which will definitely be a really interesting sight to see. It's worth noting here that Airbus is already preparing an Airbus A380 for testing with hydrogen burning turbofans and hydrogen fuel cells. And there is quite a lot of work needed to add a hydrogen fuel system onto an existing aircraft for testing like that. And this is relevant here because CFM also wants to test the RICE engine running on hydrogen. So having an Airbus A380 that can carry this fuel will come in quite handy. And do you know what else is quite handy? Clicking like and subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of my future videos. CFM also wants the RICE engine to operate on 100% sustainable aviation fuel, which is the goal for all current and new engines in the next decade. But there are a number of things that CFM will have to show to both aircraft manufacturers and to the aviation authorities before these engines will be allowed to enter service. Obviously, the first thing they're going to have to do is to validate the efficiency of that engine at the promised cruise speed of approximately Mach 0.8. In order to be able to fly that fast, CFM actually had to reduce the diameter of the RICE engine slightly from that of their previous designs. A bigger fan disc pushes more air backwards, but the tips of the fan blades also moves faster, which can be a problem the closer we get to the speed of sound. The smaller overall diameter will also help the aircraft designers a lot when it comes to the engine installation process and options. Previous open fan designs required the engines to be installed at the very rear of the aircraft, like on the MD-80 or the DC-9, which is why Boeing went with this design for the 7J-7. But CFM claims that the RICE engine will be suitable to fit under the wing of both high-wing and low-wing airliner designs. Now, there are also a lot of questions of a blade-out, which is what it's called when a fan blade breaks for whatever reason. The fan blades of a conventional turbofan are encased in such a way that they will be contained in case of a blade failure, like if the engine would hit a large bird, for example. CFM will now have to prove that this is not a problem for this new design. Of course, manufacturers of conventional turboprop aircraft are already doing this by reinforcing the fuselage alongside the propellers to be able to stop a blade that might have escaped. 
And we actually have a great example of how that might look like because during testing in the late 1980s, there was actually additional reinforcement for the vertical stabilizer of the Boeing 727 when it flew with the GE36 instead of one of its normal engines. Newer fan blades will be lighter, which helps. Plus, these fans will be spinning slower than the turbo fans that we have today. But even so, we will have to wait and see what kind of protections aircraft with these kind of engines will need to have. It's likely that these protections will be similar to what we see on today's turboprops. And obviously, additional reinforcements for the fuselage will add more weight. So, who is going to be the first one to incorporate this new engine into one of its designs, do you think? Well, frankly, it's highly unlikely that either Boeing or Airbus will let the other push ahead with a design like this without coming up with a competitor of their own. This technology would be impossible to pass up, so the answer to that question is probably both of them. And also, let's not forget Embraer, who have recently announced work on a new turboprop with a very familiar looking engine layout. Finally, what is actually the difference between an open fan engine and turboprops, especially in the case of the CFM Rise with its single fan design? Well, the difference here lies in their potential speed. Turboprops generally cruise at speeds of around max 0.55 or so, but the open fan designs will work at speeds around max 0.8, with some having pushed even 0.85 in testing. Now, that's very close to the speeds of today's turbofan aircraft, which I am operating, the 737 for example. But it's also worth pointing out here that the speed difference is not a definition. In reality, turboprops have also been evolving slowly towards the open fan layouts that we've seen in this video. Newer turboprop aircraft have propellers with more and more fan blades, allowing for a higher and higher disc loading, which in turn allows more and more speed. And also, to be perfectly honest here, the quickest turboprop of all time is not particularly new. Because that will be the Soviet Tupolev 95 bomber with four turboprop engines using counter-rotating props. It could cruise faster than Max 0.8, but the tips of its propellers were supersonic, which made it incredibly noisy. We don't know what the flight crews thought of that aircraft, but there are some stories of fighter pilots who intercepted these planes, but could stay close to them for long because of the sheer noise. In any case, I am really looking forward to see what will come of these CFM Rice engines and what they will be able to do. Now, check out this video next, which I think you're really going to enjoy, or this playlist. If you want to support the work that we do here on the channel, then consider becoming part of my lovely Patreon crew, or you can get yourself some merch using the link in the description below. Have an absolutely fantastic day and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.